Uh, so I'd like to introduce our speaker today. It's Maya Fisher. Uh, she's a JET alumni and was a JET in Kawasaki City and Kanagawa. She is a strategic consultant working in the areas of equity, education, and international exchange, and has spent more than 20 years as an international education professional, specializing in exchange programming related to Japan and China. So in the past, she has worked with the US-Japan Council, Beloit College, Youth for Understanding USA, and the Embassy of Japan in Washington, DC. She speaks and leads trainings focused on understanding race and systematic racism in global contexts, and is a very enthusiastic supporter of the next generation of talent. Most recently, Maya launched a global education diversity dialogues. It is a platform for engaging topics, uh, teaching on topics related to international education, diversity, and race. And she writes a blog and teaches virtual course how race and ethnicity shape American life to both American and Japanese audiences. And I'm sure she'll share more about herself as well. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Maya. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited to be here this evening. And I'm excited to see so many of you from all over the JET community um, to participate in tonight's session. I do hope that it will be informative for you. I do also hope that you feel free to ask any and all questions that you might have around this topic and any of the information that I present. Um, and towards the end of the session during the Q&A, I will also share my contact information in the chat. Um, I just don't want to interrupt my uh, set up for my presentation. I don't want to make sure that I don't have any problems with that. Um, so let me see if I can share my screen here. Um, so welcome. Um, as, um, as has been said, I was a JET um, back in 2000 and 2002 in the city of Kawasaki. And for the bulk of my career, I've been doing international exchange between the US and Japan. And what I hope to do tonight is to talk about these issues around diversity and inclusion in the US Japan community broadly, as well as in the pipeline and thinking into the future, um, how all of these things connect, coalesce, and then what we can do. So in the In terms of what we're going to do or how I've structured this, um, I want to take a look back at the last 70 years of the US-Japan relationship. What has it been comprised of? What have been the issues? Who have been the people? I want to talk about sort of what the challenge is right now. And um, I also want to um, talk about the impact and the connection between the um, historical events that have shaped the US-Japan relationship, talk about where we can go from here, talking about the pipeline um, and different entry points and actions that we can take as individual jets as well as allies. Um, there will be times that I will pose questions to you as well as, um, as has been said, feel free to ask any questions as we go along. So I just want to give a little bit of background and context to myself and where I'm situated in all of this stuff by sharing my journey with Japan. I studied Japanese in high school as a high school student and for the first time at the age of 15, I went to Japan um, and I attended an all girls Catholic high school. I lived with a host family and was there for the summer. And <clears throat> I made a lot of friends and ate a lot of good food that summer. And I left thinking it was a great time. I made some friends. And as all high school students do, you think that you're going to have those friends forever. Um, and it turns out, actually, that I had one of those friends forever, um, who is still a friend that I have connected with uh, since up until now. And when I went as a JET, my time in JET was really transformational for me. It was a time that I connected with people in Japan, and I was teaching at public middle school and elementary schools. I also was in Japan um, during the events of 9-11, which is um, a, a really transformational moment for me as well, experiencing all of that outside of Japan. And when I look back on my relationship with Japan and why I continue to remain engaged, 
I realize it's because of the relationships and it's because of the people that I've met. Um, it's always been about the people. These photos represent all the people that I've engaged with in Japan. My professional career has been connected to Japan in a lot of different ways, particularly as has been said, uh, focused on youth exchange. And I think um, I've really loved the work that I've done in Japan, but if I'm honest, I, as much as I love Japan, I have not always felt comfortable or welcome in the US Japan community or felt like it's been a place for me. And so that's something that I've really been thinking about a lot recently as the um, calls for racial justice in the United States have really come to the fore and thinking about what that means as I am talking to and encouraging next generation young people to be a part of this community. And so that's a little bit about me. I'd like to know who I have in the room with me today. And so I am going to launch a poll here that um, there are seven questions, um, just to give me a sense of where you're coming from, what your perspective is. So if you could just take a second and answer the questions in the poll, that would be immensely helpful. and I will see if I can catch up with the chats. give it about 30 seconds or so. Fifteen seconds. Okay, so I am going to end it. Um, and then we're just going to take a look at um, what we see here. So let me see if I can share here. Okay, so just getting a sense of who's in the room. Um, we have some great um, racial diversity here um, and also representational diversity in terms of how long people have been away from JET and how many years people have been out. Oh, okay. So there's no, there's some people in the, in the age range or the years that I've been away. So I feel good about that. Um, it's really cool to see how people first encountered Japan. The entry point is always something that is of interest to me. And it's something I'm going to talk a little bit about how you came to be a part of it. Are you professional um, in the US Japan or US related field? No, okay, but you're still here, so there's got to be some uh, connection as well. And if you always felt welcome in the US Japan community. Okay, good to know. All right. So that has is really helpful for me as I continue on thinking um, and talking to you this evening. So let's take a look briefly at the 
last 70 years of the US-Japan relationship, right? Let's take a look at who are the faces of the relationship, right? If we look at the leaders of the relationship, what do you see? Who have, the, who have been the people that we've considered the Japan hands, the experts? Who's written the books that we read about the relationship or Japan after the war? Who has advocated for collaborations, for understanding? Who's been recognized by governments um, and key organizations for their contributions to the relationship? We have noted folks like Henry Kissinger, Senator Mike Mansfield, Donald Keene, Jerry Curtis, our very own JET alum, Paige Cottingham Streeter, and the late Senator Daniel Inoue, um, a noted Japanese American leader who fought um, for those who couldn't fight for themselves in terms of advocacy for uh, those without voices. And when we look and see advertisements for events on US-Japan related topics, we often see an assembly of faces like in the bottom left. But if we think about these faces and others over the last 70 years, who don't you see in the pictures? What people are not uh, represented? So hold on to that thought and let's look at the participants of the last 70 years. So who have been the people on the ground doing programs, learning, studying, connecting the two countries? When I think of all the people who I've seen around me in the various US Japan programs that I've done over the years, and even at looking at the promotional materials for programs and activities, I've thought about getting involved in, I've noticed something. You know, I've often been in the spaces that I've been the only brown face in the room. And often I don't see faces like mine reflected in materials promoting programs. And this has been from the time that I was a high school student, when I first engaged with Japan, even up until the work that I've been doing now. And, you know, if that has, that has been my experience and that has impacted the way that I move through the US-Japan space. And that's why I've said that sometimes I haven't always felt comfortable or welcome or that it's been a space for me. But it's also not about sort of representation in that way. It's also about representation in terms of the issues and the areas for professional growth and development. When I landed my first job in DC after coming back from JET, it was at the Embassy of Japan in DC in the Congressional Affairs section. I'm pretty sure the reason that I got the job is because the diplomat who was hiring had gone to the same undergrad institution that I had and apparently we had been there at the same time. I had no interest in politics. I did know how to navigate Congress and scheduling because I'd grown up in that. My mother worked for a member of Congress, but you know, I had no interest. But in those days, in the early 2000s, there were only sort of three key areas where you could find employment, particularly in the DC area, in the US-Japan space. It was economics, security, and policy. And when I came back from Japan, from JET, I was all excited about exchange and education. And it was really hard for me to find events that reflected that interest. And it was also really difficult to find professional opportunities that reflected that interest. It's been great seeing those issue areas and job areas expand over the last 20 years, but I would say it's still pretty hard to find um, opportunities to grow outside some of these key areas. And so, you know, when I think about the people, the leaders, the participants, and the issues for Japan and the US-Japan relationship, I wonder, does it matter? You know, is this a problem? Is the fact that we don't have representation? Is it the fact that the issues are limited? Are these problems? Why do they matter? And the resounding answer is yes. This is a problem. Representation of all kinds matters, right? So who people see in front of them tells them what is possible. When people aren't there, it tells people what's not possible. Whose input is acknowledged, who's considered an expert in the US-Japan space, whose expertise is valued, that representation matters. And the US-Japan relationship will not continue 
in the next 70 years as it has from the past 70 years without meaningful and, and sustained participation from different voices. The challenges of the future will be different from the challenges of the past, and we need multiple perspectives to be a part of the conversations that, um, that challenge and meet those challenges. And if the coronavirus pandemic and the calls for racial justice in the United States have shown us anything, you do need international networks, collaborations, and people with different perspectives to meet those challenges. And so to think about the context of why the relationship has looked that way, you need to understand the impact of history and the social, uh, the institutional and structural constraints that have shaped the relationship. Because if you know the history and the constraints, then as you move forward and think about how to change those, you'll have a better idea of how to do that. So let's see. And the slide here that I have used is a representation of my experience walking into US Japan spaces, both as a participant and even as a so called expert on different things. These are some of the facial expressions that I get from people about, you know, what is she doing here? Is she in the right place? She's the speaker. And then, you know, the ways in which people interact with me, um, you know, really shapes, again, my experience in the space. And so I don't want to hammer it too much because my experience is just my experience, but it is important, as I said, to understand some of the context in which this happens. So how did we get here? How did this, you know, how does this happen? So here are some of the big events in the United States and Japan and the world that have shaped the US-Japan relationship as we know it, right? So if you look at a timeline of events, we have the end of the war in 1945. Um, we have events in the 60s and 70s around civil rights and desegregation. We have the increase of higher education opportunities amongst people of color, particularly at uh, historically black colleges and universities. We also have a language boom around the study of Japanese language that is a result of some investments that the American military had made in the early 1940s that resulted in this whole generation of Japanologists who went and spread out in the United States and who taught in all of these different fields, literature, history, law, sociology. And they were embedded in different institutions around the US and they taught and they started programs, East Asian studies programs, Japanese language programs, where people started to learn and study Japanese. So we saw a boom in the 80s, in the 70s and 80s of people in the US that were starting to study Japanese at the collegiate level. In the 90s, we saw that push down to um, high school and pre-college levels. We also had the bubble economy that drove a lot of interest in Japan. Um, after the bubble burst, we had a boom in study abroad participation and uh, exchanges between the US and Japan young people. And then in the early 2000s, we had events like 9-11 in 2011, we had the Great East Japan Earthquake. So all of these events have shaped and provided opportunities and open doors and closed doors for some of the people who've been able to participate in the US-Japan relationship. It helps to explain why we've seen the leaders that we've seen, why we see the participants that we've seen, why we see the issues that are important. Right, right after 19, the end of World War II, it was really about the security alliance between the two countries' governments. That was the formative um, creation between the, um, the two nations that really uh, cemented the relationship. So all of these things are a product of historical events and opportunities that were made possible. So that makes sense. And so when you look at the constraints, how people entered Japan, um, the US-Japan relationship. As some of you had, you entered through Japanese language study, but a lot of people have also entered through pop culture 
or family heritage, the ways in which people have entered the relationship has mattered. How people have historically recruited for programs, participants, for jobs, those events have also um, shaped the applicant pools and how we choose and select people for jobs. The pathways that a lot of US Japan leaders have taken have been very similar, right? So they have um, followed a particular path and trajectory through certain institutions, th certain programs, and have created a particular idea of what a US Japan leader looks like. The area of focus, as I said, the three areas, um, security, economics, and policy. Those have really constrained uh, professional development opportunities. There are a lot of organizations in the US Japan space, but they're also, um, some of them are small and there aren't a lot, they're generally flat, right? So they're, once you get in, you kind of mostly stay in the space that you're in. There isn't a lot of opportunity for growth. So you're mostly forced to change uh, to other organizations and companies. But once people get in, it's really hard. A lot of people don't leave. Um, so it makes entry into US Japan organizations difficult. And cultural change and cultural shifts. They have been sporadic and um, slow at times. And right now, they've all often been in response to things. I think that the crises of 2020 have created an opportunity for us to actually proactively reshape and reimagine what the US-Japan relationship looks like, what the issues will be, what the jobs will be. We have a really unique opportunity to not have people tell us what those things will be, but to actually create and shape it in a way that we think can be more equitable, more inclusive, and forward thinking and responsive to the future that we all face. So in the next 70 years, what will be the issues? Definitely, I think climate change, global health, technology that connects us. I think what we've seen is that you know, Zoom is great for some things, but Zoom is not the answer for all things connected. Um, I would like to see people out there developing different technology and platforms to provide meaningful engagement, reflection, transformative learning, um, transformative communication. This is the time, even if we have vaccines for coronavirus, I still think the virtual will be with us for a really, really long time. And so that's an opportunity for growth and development and contribution. Aging in society is definitely one that Japan is going to face. Collaborations with space, as I said, global health, and most notably, all of this talk and conversation around direct diversity, equity, and inclusion. Those will be, I think, the issues that shape the future of the relationship, as well as the opportunities for jobs, for careers, for contributions. And if we think about who will be the leaders and who will be the participants, we need to think about where they're going to come from. You know, what will be their entry points? What will be their experiences? And how will their pathways be different as they navigate the US-Japan relationship? So before I go to the pipeline um, question or the talking about the pipeline, I've seen a lot of chats pop up. Um, and let's see, I'm going to ask Casey, is, are there any sort of, are these just comments or questions? <laughs> it seems, like, like <laughs> seems like there's a lot of uh, comments about, uh, people are really liking what you're saying um, about okay. the virtual space, <laughs> virtual space being a big thing in the future. Um, Black Lives Matter support trickling into Japan, um, having some effect in the future. Um, let's see. The timeline, people really appreciated the timeline that you spoke about uh, and giving cultural context to sort of where we're at now. And oh, someone posted a link about the Black Lives Matter in, in Kansai that just happened, the discussion. In Chicago, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, okay. so that's, that's the, the comments you're getting, but people, people are enjoying it, yeah. Okay, just wanted to take a temperature check and see what, what people had to say. Um, 
Okay, so the, the you know the, the topic of this talk is about the pipeline, right? Um, and everybody navigates their own pathway through the US Japan space, whether it's as a professional or as just somebody who has an interest and wants to contribute to the community. And so as I was sitting and thinking about this talk, I tried to imagine and put down sort of a visual representation of how I understand the pipeline. So I'm going to share that, but please know it's not perfect. I haven't captured everything and it's complex and I'm sure there will be changes to this as well. Right. So what I try to do is I try to think of sort of what people do, how they come into the relationship, what people do in terms of developing and deepening their relationship and connection to Japan. I looked at thinking about their professional opportunities and how any or all of this can lead to non US Japan professional opportunities, as well as um, sort of being identified as experts or, you know, key people in the relationship. And so at each of these numbered juncture points, I think is where we have the opportunity to make tweaks and changes in the process, make changes in the structure of the pipeline to open and expand uh, people's access, equitable access to it, and also sort of widen the pipes or allow the more people into certain areas that perhaps they have not been able to, uh, to move through before, right? So the pipeline is not just about getting people into the end, but it's also about looking at how people navigate the pipeline, how people sort of get into and through the pipeline quicker or less quickly than others, where people get directed and turned around. And so, as I talked about historically, where people entered the US-Japan relationship historically has really been around language, right? So formal language study. But that was, you know, 80s and 90s. By the time I started working with young people in the 2000s, their entry points were pop culture, right? And there is this mindset that language study is more important and long-term and more likely to keep people in the relationship. I would actually challenge that because I do think that people who can find a personal connection, whether that's pop culture, whether that's family, whatever the connection is, that's what sustains people's engagement. That's what keeps people engaged. And so when we're looking at entry points, we need to think about how do people meet the relationship? How do people get excited in the US about Japan? How do people in Japan get excited about the United States? There are so many more entry points than there have ever been that when we think about the different ways of people coming in, then we again get to attract and keep people who bring different experiences, people who bring um, different perspectives to the relationship and again, expand um, the depth and diversity of the relationship writ large. The other thing that I think is important to note is that for some people, the JET program is their entry point. They may not have had any Japan experience before JET, right? And so if JET is their first experience with Japan, right, it's important to make sure that that first experience is welcoming, it's something that's transformative, it's something that excites them and keeps them wanting to come back and stay engaged in the US-Japan community. So entry points and how we think about and meet people and bring people in, that's one way of starting and expanding um, the types of people, the numbers of people, the representations of people that we have in the US-Japan talent pipeline. And sort of the next phase is how people deepen that experience, right? So for JET, it could be their entry point and the way that they deepen their relationship to Japan. That can be simultaneous. For others, it is, you know, formal education, right? So it could be classes in high school, it could be college, it could be informal cultural study. You could be studying martial arts or other forms of Japanese arts. So there is a place where people are deepening their relationships with Japan. 
And then people move on from those experiences often to their first US Japan related job, right? Um, after JET for you know, new college graduates, JET was their first job, but they continue and move on to uh, working for a US Japan organization. In Washington DC, most returning JETs compete and vibe for positions at the embassy in DC. That's kind of like the first job that you get out of JET for a lot of people. Not everyone, because there are more people, more returnees than there are positions. But that is one place where people start. And this is a critical juncture because it's in this place where people begin to build networks, where they start to connect with people, they start to explore their opportunities in the US-Japan space, and they identify mentors or people to help advise or guide them in their journeys. And if you tap into good, expansive, and deep networks, then you're good, right? But not everybody can do that or has that opportunity for a number of reasons. But that is really important because what happens is, is people might get that first US Japan job, but if they can't make the next step, if they can't advance in their career, then what happens is they end up leaving professionally the US Japan space. Right? They have to explore other opportunities, which is unfortunate. Luckily, sometimes they can't do it professionally, so they end up doing it volunteer uh, or in some other capacity, continue to contribute to the US-Japan relationship, but they can't, um, they just can't do it professionally. And those who can, those who tap into the right networks or tap into the right mentors, they get moved into some of these flagship programs and opportunities that ultimately lead them down the pathway of leadership and to becoming US-Japan hands, right? So these are the Fulbright programs. These are the Hitachi Fellows. These are the Network for the Future programs. These are people who join the foreign service, right? So these are the key people. Um, these are the key pathways and the jobs that result in people being considered and identified as experts in um, US-Japan relations. And I will say, if you don't sort of fit into that mold or you don't tap into the right networks, you might not have that opportunity to move along that pathway. And I think the relationship loses out on people who don't, who don't necessarily have access to those mentorship um, and networks that really, really inform and propel people through the pipeline towards positions of influence um, and responsibility and power. So the question is, where can we make action? Where can we take action, right? So if we look at structural places where we can act, right? I've already talked about entry points. Rethink and reimagine where and how people uh, come to the US-Japan relationship. Think about how we present, what message are we sent, what message and face of the relationship are we presenting that is inviting to people. Broaden our uh, promotion and recruitment for programs and jobs, op job opportunities. We have a tendency for programs for jobs to go to the same wells, to go to the same schools, to go to the same uh, platforms that, you know, promote jobs and interns even. Um, but with just a little bit more work and a little bit different thinking, you might open yourself up to more, um, a broader spectrum of people who are interested and have the ability to contribute to the relationship in creative and unique ways. I've done this with programs um, that I started. I did a program uh, for um, the, uh, in my position at the US Japan Council, where I did a regional program that brought together American and Japanese students in regions all over the, the United States. And I had to find my applicants, right? And so where did I find them? You can go to the languages, you can go to the departments, but we also went to the club activities. We also went to some of the community organizations in the region. So just sort of thinking, like opening up a little bit more how you recruit and how you identify the pools for jobs and opportunities can increase 
um, again, applicants and diversity in the pipeline. Expand your networks for information and opportunities, and not just when you have to or in response to something. Right, be proactive. I wrote recently or last a couple months ago in my blog that you know you can get connected to networks, um, professional networks for women in foreign service or um, administrators at HBCUs. Plug into networks when you don't have to in ways that are um, real so that when you have opportunities, when you have programs that you're ready to promote, you can, um, you can use those and share those with those networks. And again, broaden the people that can come in. And then I think, especially in this uh, 2020 environment, we really need to think and reimagine our models for leadership. Um, I think, you know, the people that have led the relationship in the last 70 years, it's, you know, it's been great. It's one of the strongest bilateral alliances that our countries have. But I do think that there are opportunities to do better. And I do think that success in the last even 20 years is not going, the recipe for success for the last 20 years is not going to be the recipe uh, in a post-COVID, post-racial justice world. Um, and so we need people to be proactive. We need people to be um, uh, visionary and people who can see change and bring people along uh, who want to uh, facilitate that change. So those are some of the structural things that we can do to tackle this. What can we do interpersonally, right? Um, as, I, as I've said, networking and mentorship is really, really important. It can really shape where people go, where people don't go, and whether or not people stay in the US-Japan space professionally or even personally. And so people need to get comfortable with being able to mentor people who look like you, who don't look like you, who are different from you. I, in my, in my professional career, have mentored men. I've mentored, you know, non-Black people. I've mentored Japanese people. I've mentored people who are in, interested in politics and political science and economics. I support people as people. And there are so many more different modes of mentorship nowadays. Not everybody buys into them, but there are different ways that people can support people across differences that you can still encourage and support people um, in ways that can provide them with the necessary information and access that can help move them more quickly along the pipeline um, and into potentially opportunities in the pipeline. We need to rethink our criteria and metrics for success of some of our programs, how we hire people, how we select people for some of these programs. What are the criteria? Um, some of the standard criteria may be easy, right? Like if you go by, you know, GPAs or, you know, leadership positions or all of these other things, you can just sort of count them up. You're missing out on people whose backgrounds, whose experiences may not provide them with access or opportunities for those, but that doesn't mean that they're any less worthy or capable of doing the work or performing in the program. And that's a perspective that I brought to creating um, the criteria for the Watanabe Study Abroad Scholarship. I took out GPAs. I was like, you know, for people who come from first generation backgrounds or from single parent families, their experiences may not allow them to do the traditional things that we use as metrics for success or accomplishment. And so I decided, let's hear people's stories, let people tell us about them. Yeah, it's a different way of evaluating, but what I found is that the people who got the scholarship with those criteria are people who not only excelled in the program in their time abroad, they fully embraced it and have really been transformed and have given back to the community for that opportunity. And so rethinking our criteria and how we evaluate um, success for programs and positions. The other thing is just be open and create a welcoming environment at events and activities. Right? So when you go to picnics for Jet AA, or if you go to receptions or events, um, a lot of times people congregate with people that they know. They're not open to 
um, meeting new people, that again can be off-putting and you know turn people off and make people not want to come. And I know as Jets, we like to uh, gather in the communities that we know, especially within our regions. Uh, you know, when we see each other, we like to hang out. It's the same way when we were in Japan, we like to hang out with each other. But that can create an unwelcome environment. And if you're talking about how people come in, what people encounter when they come into the relationship, if they encounter an unwelcome or an uninviting environment, it can turn people. And then the last thing is interpersonally is to know that your story is not the only story, right? So the way that you came in, your experience, um, your knowledge is not the only way. And so when you're thinking of all of these things, recruitment, programs, mentoring, recognizing that other people bring different things, skills, experiences to the table, recognizing and respecting that and finding ways to connect with people beyond that so you can still support and encourage them. Um, so I want to pivot here for a second. Um, and let me stop and see, are there any questions? We did get a right. question okay. from Paige. How okay. critical are educators at the initial point of entry? To what extent, if any, do you think bias on the part of educators influences who pursues Japan studies and who doesn't? Um, I mean, I think educators are important. Uh, my Japanese teacher in high school is the person who told me about the JET program when I was 15 years old. Um, and that stuck in my mind, even though I didn't do Japanese throughout college, I knew it was something that I wanted to do, JET was something I wanted to do at the end. And so I think educators do have a role. I do think that there needs to be a recognition that Japanese language expertise is not the only thing or is not the most critical thing that you need to be successful in the US Japan world. There are a lot of people who are doing great things who are successful who understand Japanese culture without being fully fluent in Japanese. And so I think on the part of educators, I think helping people find their passion in the US Japan world. If it's in language, that's great. But if it's not in language, if people can't do the grammar, which I couldn't do. I wasn't great at Japanese grammar. Um, you know, encourage and support other passions that allow them to stay connected to Japan and to think about other ways that they can contribute professionally or voluntarily to the relationship and not just language. I know that's the job of Japanese language teachers is to, you know, get people to learn Japanese. But I do think there is a role and a space for educators to help their students understand and recognize that if you're not successful in, you know, um, being a Japanese, you know, linguistic expert or just being, you know, N1 in Japanese language, that doesn't mean that there isn't a space for you in the relationship. So that message can be really, really important. And I think that's the message that needs to be part of what educators um, do and say to people in, um, in this space. Does that answer the question or at least start to answer the question? Okay. It's a great answer, yeah. Um, I also had a question. You talked a sure. lot about uh, mentors and the importance of mentors, especially in keeping people in the pipeline. Uh, what is a good way to find a mentor in the space? And then also, if maybe you're further along in your career and you want to help others, like what is a good way to find mentees that may need help? Um, so, I mean, I, I do think it depends on what it is you're looking for. So as I said, there are lots of different models now for mentors. Your mentor doesn't need to be somebody who is, you know, with you from, you know, the, the beginning of your career to the end. Um, some people talk about, you know, assembling your board of support, like different people who can support you in different things and at different stages of your career and assembling them to help you as you move through. Um, when I was in graduate school at Wisconsin in my PhD program, my advisor who supervised my dissertation, 
he had no idea about anything related to international education. He was a social psychologist. He did sexuality studies, but he thought what I did was interesting and wanted to support me and encourage me. And he was like, whatever you need, just let me know. Um, so that I think is something that I've thought about and really tried to capture in my interaction with people. So when I've done programs, I've let people know, you know, send me an email, let's talk, let's have coffee in terms of being open and available to mentees. And when looking for mentors, I think connecting with people who not just topically you, um, you aspire or who inspire you in that way, but someone that you connect with as, as a human being, right? So people who are really honest and straightforward, right? How do they, how are they successful and navigate the US Japan space with that attitude, right? So somebody who can teach you something that you feel is going to be part of your, your success, your story, your toolkit um, to move through, I think is one way of approaching looking for mentors and thinking about being open to um, anybody and um, you know, being willing to have coffees with people to find out if there's a way to connection is a way to um, seek and uh, be open to mentees. And I know that um, some of the uh, JET uh, alumni or JET AA groups are doing um, mentorship programs. I'm part of one that the JET AA DC is doing. Um, and so you know, participating in those opportunities when they pop up so that people know that that's also something that you're interested in. Does that help? Yes. And we also have a mentoring session on Saturday. If you <laughs> haven't signed up for that, you should do that. Um, it looks like we had another question in the chat. Uh, I love the idea of changing criteria for how we evaluate applicants for programs, especially those allowing others the chance to gain entry to the US-Japan career space. Have you dealt with any resistance to changes you've suggested? And if so, how did you navigate those moments? That is a great question. And yes, I have met resistance. <laughs> um, so as I said, when I did the, when I created the, um, the Watanabe Scholarship Criteria, when I brought in the committee members, so I chaired both of the selection committees for the US and the Japanese applicants. And my first year, there were committee members who really, really wanted, you know, um, the GPAs, even though they were optional and didn't enter into the calculations, they wanted to know what they were. They also wanted to know what schools these people, these students, the applicants went to. Um, and I decided to remove those indicators because those are, again, are things that frame and create lenses through which people consumed the applicant information. And so, and when I did that, they would ask, why are you doing that? And what I would say is I was like, look, the focus is for our donor and what we're trying to achieve with the scholarship is to provide opportunities for people who otherwise might be overlooked with traditional programs. It doesn't mean that they aren't qualified. We're just looking for different things and different experiences to fulfill this program. And so when I framed it like that, they were like, oh, that makes sense. And yes, it created a little bit more work. Yes, they had to read essays and sort of think about and um, you know work with the rubrics for those. But over the years, um, you know, even when I brought in new people, they started to understand and believe and see the results of the selected applicants um, and people that we gave the scholarships to. And they recognized that just because they didn't use these previous criteria or these other pre-existing criteria didn't mean that they still couldn't be excellent representatives and scholarship recipients. So that's just one way. Um, I'm still muted. Uh, that's a great way to navigate that. Uh, let's see, we have a question from Maria. In the context of working with students from Japan at universities, many struggle speaking out against acts, acts of inclusion, exclusion, microaggressions happening to around them in the US, let alone directly as soon as it happens. 
happens. As an educator, leadership facilitators, what exercises can I do to help students develop and use their voices in a cultural context outside their own? Um, that's a great and complicated question. Um, so there are um, a couple of exercises that I've done in my um, race and ethnicity class, and I just finished up um, earlier this month. And one of them is I usually like to create a space where students can ask questions, right? Um, where they can ask any questions that they've always wanted to answer that they have felt that were um, offensive or they were afraid to ask or they never had a space to ask the question. And my commitment as just an educator and a person who feels that being able to talk about these issues and answer the questions is really important. I've always agreed to answer the questions and I answer them in two ways. I answer them as a sociologist. So from a sociological perspective, I put that hat on and then I answer them as Maya, the girl on the street, um, you know, just my everyday opinion. And what I find is that the release for them of asking the question and being able to at least get some information begins to help them both walk through these spaces and be able to see and understand what they're seeing, but then also begin to develop their voices. And then there's an exercise that I do in the context of a class that helps people figure out if there's a subject that they want to talk about, what is a medium or something that they can do, right? So how are they comfortable? Is it art? Is it song? Is it um, doing a blog, writing a video? What is their voice and how are they most comfortable doing it? And then we do actually um, an opportunity for them to, uh, to use their voice or their medium to be able to talk about that. But that's usually a process um, and it's not something that I've been able to do sort of in a one sitting. But I do think creating spaces for people to ask the questions that they carry around with them is the beginning of the process. And then doing exercises like the, the one that I did in my class that allows people to develop their voices by figuring out how they're most comfortable expressing and uh, their knowledge and understanding about these issues uh, to other people. But I'm more than willing to talk about sort of details and how you might structure that um, if you if you want to follow up. And she followed up with the recommendation for everyone, uh, Subtle Acts of Exclusion by Tiffany, Jana, and Michael Barron. Um, she said that, that she highly recommends it and uh, it sort of goes over some of those those microaggressions that she talked about, so. Yeah. Um, okay, so I know we are um, down to our last few minutes. Um, and so I wanted to just pivot a little bit and talk about sort of what 2020 has taught us in terms of not just sort of as Americans and Jets, but how we continue, we can continue our work as ambassadors for the US to a Japanese audience, right? Because I said at the beginning that some of what's happened in both with coronavirus and with the racial justice protests has really shifted Japanese understandings of what America is, what is happening. Um, the coronavirus has revealed, you know, sort of previously um, unacknowledged inequities across all aspects of American life. It's highlighted the necessity of international um, networks and collaborations, both with the vaccine study and then also understanding patterns of the disease, especially um, in the early days. And the demands for racial justice, as I said, have complicated Japanese perspectives of what is, you know, what is happening in the U.S., as well as um, you know, we have seen this outpouring of Black Lives Matters and diversity statements, right? But that's no longer enough. Now people are demanding action, right? But most organizations and entities are frozen because they don't know how to take those next steps or put things into action. And there is sort of this need to acknowledge that long-term change um, 
is a commitment. It's a marathon, not a sprint. We need to advocate and fight for real change and not just pseudo change. Um, and all of this stuff sort of raises a mirror to Japan so that you know, they have to deal with their own issues as it relates to diversity um, and inclusion. And in Japan, that phrase even has its own meaning, right, which is different from the US. And so, you know, here's, here's the problem, right? So we have at the beginning of the summer, we had the NHK video of protests as looters um, and that has robbed people of color of their humanity um, and sort of shown them as, you know, raving, angry um, thugs. We have Japanese in blackface um, as comedians, as just entertainment. Um, as recently as last week, Naomi Osaka, even though she won the US Open, her sponsors were not behind her in her mask protests for Black Lives Matter. She wore a different mask with a name of somebody who had been victimized by the police. Her sponsor spoke out against that. And even going back to um, Japanese treatment and recognition of its Ainu or its indigenous people. And, you know, back in 2015, when we had um, a biracial winner of the Miss Universe Japan contest, right? So we have all of these things that are happening in the space, right? And um, what I've been hearing from people in Japan is that they're seeing all this, but they don't know how to process it, right? So what can we as JETS do with this as it relates to Japan and Japanese people in particular, right? So as we've talked about sort of um, critique and question your own positions, your practices, what you are doing, right? Um, you know, not saying that anybody's doing anything wrong, but try to understand where your assumptions are being driven, where your actions are being driven by what you're doing um, and where potentially you can do better. Hold people accountable for their words and their actions. Um, and you can ask other people to hold you accountable. But in this space and in this time, people, we really need to stand up and challenge the words. If people, um, I've experienced in a staff meeting um, where somebody has said, you know, all lives matter, but we can't say black lives matter, you know, and people sort of being stunned <laughs> by it, but not saying anything. Right, so hold people accountable for what they say and what they do because that matters. As I said, we need to demand real change, so long-term systemic change rather than temporary flashy change that in six months is going to be gone. Share your experiences that now in the United States with the Japanese that you've connected with as a jet, right? So hopefully you still have some of those relationships talk about the issues, talk about what's happening, talk about what you're thinking, what, how it's making you feel. Um, be another touch point of information for Japanese who right now only have the media or um, you know, the social media or the news or some of these other um, uh, uh, sources of information. And stop assuming <laughs> that you know things about other people. Um, either in the relationship or in the spaces that you occupy. Be open to learning new things about people, about processes, about um, just the world at large. Be willing to have these uncomfortable conversations. Uh, I know it's hard, it's not easy, it's loaded. People have a lot of emotional connection to these topics and these issues, and it can be hard but it's important to have the courage to have them. And if you don't know how to, find and seek out people who know how to or who can help you do this. Um, whether it's what the, the book that Maria recommended or a conversation with someone like me about how to do it or taking a class or you know, book lists or other types of activities, um, you know, there's so much out there now in a way that hasn't been out there that's accessible and there's so many people who want to encourage and facilitate all of this change uh, that there's there um, I've, I find it highly unlikely that you're not able to find somebody uh, who can help you 
um, start to have or start to think about how you might have these conversations. And so that's something that all jets can do. Um, all of us in the US Japan space can do. Um, but I want to turn specific to um, what allies can do. And I will say from a racial justice perspective, what white allies, men and women in the US Japan space can do to help uh, advance and move the needle on some of these issues. So I would challenge and ask, I would actually ask um, for your help in using your privilege for good. All of this racial justice stuff that's happened since the killing of George Floyd, for people of color, these things have been happening for years, right? But this summer has been different. New voices, ally voices have joined in our um, arguments and uh, protests in ways that are opening up doors that are forcing um, industries, companies to change. And that kind of allyship needs to be sustained and continued and has a place in the US-Japan space. So I would ask to continue to educate yourself and others, continue to learn, to continue to attend you know, programs or opportunities like this, um, read books, listen to podcasts, uh, have conversations, ask questions of people, listen and observe to what is happening around you, um, take what people say seriously, whether it's prejudices um, or, you know, statements of accountability, listen and observe and take it in and take it seriously. Developing empathy. Right, so not sympathy. Um, this, I think, is one thing that is critical and that will be um, important in the long term. Empathy is about understanding and putting yourself in other people's shoes, not just saying like, I know how you feel, but I feel how you feel. Um, putting yourself in the shoes of other uh, marginalized people, you can't feel it the same way, but there are, you can, you can have the same feelings of not having a voice, to feeling overlooked, feeling that you have been targeted in some way. Those are sort of commonplace fundamental things that you can share and relate to with people. So empathy is really, I think, one of the critical pieces. Recognize and encourage those who speak out. So many people who stand up against these things or who speak out publicly or in uh, professional spaces feel like they're doing it alone. So whether it's to support them in that staff meeting, if they called out the person who said all lives matter, if you're not comfortable doing that, even after the staff meeting, just pulling them aside or sending them a short chat message and saying like, I hear you, I feel you, you know, um, you know, what, is there anything that we can do together around this? Help people to know that they are not alone. That encourages them, that gives people motivation to keep fighting. And this is one that I think is really um, unique. Stand in the gap for people who don't have the voice or the power to do it for themselves. This means putting yourself in situations, taking a risk, to stand up for those who can't stand up or who aren't in positions to do it themselves. You, by just being a white woman or a white man in the US-Japan space, automatically opens people's eyes, ears, and uh, minds in ways that mine may not be able to. And so if you can take the risk and stand up um, and, um, you know, help people to understand that not just, you know, marginalized racial groups or marginalized people of color are watching, but people who are also like them are, are watching as well. That again is an accountability action. And I can pretty much guarantee the consequences of you taking that risk or standing up are significantly less than if somebody like me were to do that. And again, if people's eyes, ears, and hearts aren't open, then you know I'm speaking to a brick wall. Um, and then the last thing is this is relates to what Maria was talking about is helping people find their voices 
um, and do only what you yourself can do. Your unique way of contributing, your unique way of helping to move the needle, um, that is really, really important. And that's something that only you can do. So find that thing that you can do to contribute and to help um, and that would be greatly appreciated. So I just have two quotes to leave you with. One is from um, former U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, and it's about your voice. Um, she said, it took me a quite a long time to develop my voice, and now that I have it, I will not be silent. Um, and so once you find it, once you get um, confident or comfortable or just feel like you need to say something, it's probably something that nobody would ever be able to take, you, take away from you once you have it. And then the last one is a quote from uh, President Obama um, that he said on his inauguration night, which is about knowledge. And this goes back to the issue of educating oneself. But knowledge is, a, uh, is not simply a bundle of facts, but a tool, a weapon to combat and um, a, to deploy in addressing the challenges and urgent problems of the day. These are the challenges that we all face um, and equipping yourself with knowledge and information is how we're going to combat those challenges. Um, and you can be both somebody who gets more knowledge, but then also you can be somebody who shares knowledge with others as well. So I will stop that. I will get off my soapbox now. Um, but uh, if you want to talk more, feel free. You can email me. I'll put my LinkedIn information in the chat box um, so it can be shared at a later date. Uh, but thank you so much um, for your participation.